This episode of Grilled by the Staff Canteen is sponsored by Westlands, the premier specialist British grower of microleaf, growing cresses, edible flowers, inspired leaves, sea herbs and specialty tomatoes. Visit www.westlandsuk.co.uk to find out more. Hello everyone and welcome to the Grilled podcast by the Staff Canteen. My name is Canny. I'm the deputy editor of the Staff Canteen. And today I'm really, really happy to be joined by Ben Crittenden, uh, who is the chef and owner of Stark in Broadstairs in Kent. Um, and this is our Chef to Watch feature. So why is Ben a chef to watch? Arguably, he's been on a lot of other people's radar for a while. Uh, ben is a Michelin starred chef. Ben has featured in the Good Food Guide. He was their chef to watch, I think, in 2017. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's right, yeah. Uh, he's had rave reviews in the newspapers um, and, you know, just scrolling through your trip advisor. I know that's, uh, that can be frowned upon, but, um, you know, beaming reviews all around. So you're doing, you're doing pretty well for yourself. Yeah. Got plenty of things to talk about, uh, namely, you know, the dreaded coronavirus, Michelin, what's happening with them this year. But um, before that, I kind of just want to talk about you, Ben. So first of all, hello, Ben, and welcome. Oh yeah. <laughs> How are you? You doing good? Yeah, yeah, not too bad. Busy, busy, which is good, I guess, in these this situation we're in at the moment. But yeah. So first and foremost, I want to give our audience because m- most of our audience are either chefs or hospitality workers, and mm. as much as they love to know what's going on with other chefs and in other restaurants, they don't actually get a chance to leave the kitchens very often. So to give them a sort of insight into who you are your background, your food, all of that. So maybe let's start with that. How does a chef from Kent become a multi-award winning chef? Where do you come from? How did you get here? Uh, (laughs) Well, I don't know. I don't really think about it very often. Um, It's basically, I just started chefing from school. I got an apprenticeship at a local restaurant and uh, fell in love with it, as most people do. Worked there for done my two year apprenticeship and sort of, um, the place I was working at was shutting down. Um, so I ended up getting a job, uh, Rhodes W1 in London. Um, for, worked there for a couple of years. Um, when was this? Sorry? Well, when was this? That was, uh, so I was 18, so that was 2008, I think. Okay. So 2007, 2007, 2008, I think I started there. Um, okay, very good. There Sorry? It would have been a very good time to work at Rhodes. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was quite a good time. It was a sort of, so I worked in his brasserie in W1, and, they, and mm-hmm. at the time he was opening up his fine dining bit, which I, I was tempted to go towards, but I was a, I was a bit uh, put off by the Michelin thing. I didn't think I was good enough for that sort of thing. Um, I was quite happy working in the brasserie. It was a busy place, but I liked the people I was working with. I learned a lot. Um, probably... Th- thought I learned a lot more than I did um because I sort of got on with everyone and I sort of I don't know I quite enjoyed working there when I left I think I felt like I knew more than I actually did mm. um but I left there and I ended up I was going to go I was going to move to Australia um but I was going to do a year there but I, and I went to Australia but um I met my wife my now wife like literally a month before I went I ended up being in Australia for like three months um and I ended up coming back thinking I could persuade her to move out with me, but then <laughs> she didn't. Um, so then from that, I sort of um, thought, all right, if I'm going to have to be stuck in, in England, then I might as well try and better myself job-wise. And first I took a job as a temp originally at a place called the Marquis in Auckland, um, near Dover, which was at the time pretty good. It's still there, but it's, um, it's a bit shite now, I think. Um, um, and then I was there for like, I think I was about a year. And then I sort of wanted to sort of do something else. So I just looked around in Kent because I didn't really fancy going back to London. So I just applied for a load of jobs in, in Kent and um, applied for a job at the West House in Bindon. Um, yeah. And I got, got the job there, which was, quite, which was a good, good move for me because it was just me and um, the owner, Graham. Um, and at first I said to him, I said, I can commit to a year because I was living in Ramsgate and in Biddenden, which is a good hour, hour and a half drive. I was doing that every day. Um, so I said, I can do it for a year. And I ended up there six years. 
Um, <laughs> so it was good. Um, I was head chef there for the last 18 months I was there. Um, and then sort of, you know, things happen. Um, doing a lot of driving. So in that time as well, we had, we had our first child when I was 24. Um, and so was on her own. So she ended up moving back to Essex to be around her family while I was working. So then I ended up traveling from Essex to Kent um, a couple of times a week and then sofa surfing like three or four nights a week, um, which, which ended up getting a bit, yeah, ended up getting, a, it took its toll eventually and um, decided, yeah, so I ended up having a few issues and stuff and I was, got to a point where I was going to, I was going to jack it all in, to be honest. Um, but I didn't really know what to do and I was, I was going to end up doing um, sort of like outside catering sort of thing, like, food festivals and stuff like that i bought a um, an old volkswagen caddy van I'd, I'd kit it out so i put a table in the back for a green egg i got a generator and then to do griddles and stuff like that bought all that and then um i was randomly in broadstairs and stumbled across a place that was empty and yeah. i thought i'd inquire about that didn't think anything would come of it and then i heard back from the, the land the landlord or um I spoke to him and he said, told me what the rent was. And I thought, well, that's year I could possibly do that. Thinking I could pay the rent. I didn't have any money at this time. I was, I was skint. But I, um, I thought, fuck it, I'll give it a go. Um, and I agreed to take on the place before I actually had any finances. And I thought it can't be that hard to sort of get a little bit of money together. I think I'm just lick a paint, do it. Um, but I ended up like I went to a bank and they laughed at me um but then I, I did some some digging and I found there's um startup loan companies right. um and I ended up going through that and managing to get 15 grand loan um which I thought was loads of money turns out it's not to, to, to open a restaurant but um I ended up doing a lot of the, I did all the work with my dad and, and his mate gave us a hand as well and so I left the West House and did agency work for a year just because it's hourly paid sort of it's quite flexible gave me the time the freedom to sort of work when I wanted when I needed more money I could do more hours and stuff like that and uh, basically spent put everything everything into into this refurb and it turned it wasn't just a lick of paint I ended up having to gut the place and did everything um everything apart from the ceiling we ended up having to rip out and replace <clears throat> um we thought it'd take three months it took 10 um and yeah literally rinsed us of everything and we, by the time we opened yeah i had i think i had 500 pounds my name oh wow okay oh, and that's sort of an overdraft as well it wasn't even my money um yeah so we opened on that which was quite scary so when we ended up opening stark I carried on doing agency work two days a week just so I could guarantee I could pay my rent at home. Um, and we'd do like one table a night for the first three months, like one or two tables. We'd open any day people wanted to come, we'd open. Um, and if we weren't open, I'd do agency work, basically. Um, so yeah, it was a struggle to get open. But then after after eight months, we got reviewed in The Guardian. Um, I remember that was beginning of August. And we suddenly went from doing like, so because we were only small, we only had 12 seats at the time. Um, we went from doing like four people a night, Fridays and Saturdays sometimes we'd be fully booked, to then end up being like, then full for like two months because of the demands of that. And it was literally two weeks after that we got the Good Food Guide Award as well. And all of a sudden it went mental when we filled up for the rest of the year. And we stopped taking bookings from beginning of January the next year um and we've pretty much been fully booked since then <laughs> really. um Crazy. yeah it, it sounds to me like you are first and foremost an incredibly hard worker and that you came about doing what you do just to, to keep going really just to, to you know to yeah. make sure that you had some money coming in and that you yeah. were you were striving for something is that yeah i've never so i'm I didn't have a like, uh, I've brought up, I'm on one of five, I've got, I've got three brothers and a sister. Mm -hmm. um, and my mum, my parents never had loads of money 
growing up, we, we, we were right. But like, if I wanted to go out with my mates, I had to earn the money myself. So I didn't get pocket money or anything like that. Um, so I, even as a kid, I'd go and help my dad at work. He's a, he's a carpenter joiner, so I'd clean up sawdust and all that sort of shite. Um, as soon as I was old enough, I got, I got two paper rounds. And so one in the morning, one in the evening. And I'd deliver Chinese leaflets as well for a Chinese restaurant just to get as much money. So I wanted to go out on a Saturday night with my mate. So I needed the money. Or on well, a Saturday night, I was only 13. But um, if I wanted to go out and have money to go out, I'd, I'd have to earn it myself. Um, and my dad's always worked um, silly hours. So I think that sort of just rubbed off on me. If I want to, if I want to better myself, I want to do something, I've got to earn it. Um, yeah. and I think it's a good way of doing it. Um, you know, I've I've not been given anything by my family, but it's like refurbing the restaurant. My dad's done it for me um, and hasn't charged me labour costs or anything like that, which is which is good. Um, and yeah, and I think that's one something that sort of is sort of frustrating when people assume. That you, you know, just because you've got a restaurant, it's like you've been given, given it. And when, when you think, when you actually see how hard it has been for us to do it, um, we haven't been gifted anything. We've had to bust our works to get to where we are and do what we do. And it's even when it comes down to like, like we get emails all the time from chefs, like locally, saying they want to come and do a day with us to see how we work it and see we can do it. Because what they want to do eventually is they want to have a small place like ours. And it's sort of thing. You're doing it all the wrong way around because you're, you're head chef in a shit pub down the road earning fuck 35 grand a year. That's more than I've ever earned in my life. Um, the most I've ever earned on a salary was 25 grand. And that's as head chef of a Michelin star restaurant. Um, so, and it's not about making, I make, don't make money out of doing what I'm doing. I do it, um, I make enough just to sort of get by. Um, and yeah, it's, it's not it's not about making money for me and i think if you want to do what i do you have to sort of do the graft of learning learning properly how to do things and accepting that you're not gonna make loads of money out of what you do it's more about work-life balance and, and having freedom to do what you want to do yeah and the, that, that hard graft is that would that would you say that's the sole thing that drives you is that that idea of having a trade, having a craft, having something that you know how to do with your hands that you can rely on. Yeah. I've always I've always wanted to bet myself. I've always had a thing of, um, I don't, like, even when I was working in a team of people, I, don't, I never wanted to be the weakest link. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always constantly trying to bet myself so I'm, I'm not the weakest link. I know I'm not, I'm not the best chef in the world. I know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that I'm capable um obviously i was i wouldn't have opened a restaurant myself um but i doubt it I, I question everything i do um and i constantly want to better myself um and that's what drives me and that's what i think um and having the kids to be honest and having the kids when i was 24 not a lot of money it sort of gives you the drive it gives you a purpose to sort of work um to better yourself not just for myself but for my kids as well um and and that's that's what my purpose is in is now is just to constantly try and better myself to support my kids to support my family really um and that's my motivation um uh yeah it's, that's why i've just opened a bigger restaurant i say bigger i've got four more seats but um <laughs> it's yeah. not, it's not, what was it? It used to be a sandwich shop there previous. But originally, yeah, the original site was a tiny. It, it like it's, when I say it's small, people say, "Oh yeah, how small is it?" It is. It is ridiculously small. It's tiny. The kitchen <laughs> was is literally six foot by eight, um, in the corner of a room. There's no parallel room walls in the room, and it's yeah, like most people's domestic kitchens are bigger than the whole restaurant. No, um, I'm pretty sure I've seen pop ups in Shoreditch bigger than that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but like we had people come in and saying they knew they knew it was small, but like how small it is, it is ridiculous. And and to think, well, when I look back now and and see what we achieved from that space, it is quite mental to be. Yeah, fair. I mean, if you can fit it, among all of your guests, you can fit the critics in. It means that you know they know yeah. about you and they they're on your case. Mm, yeah, That's something to be proud of. Yeah. But I, yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about your food and your, your yeah. sort of 
brand of food, what it is that you enjoy, what yeah. gets your creative juices flowing, what you're about food-wise, I guess. Um, well, I just like to use the best um, produce I can, really. Um, the menu-wise, it changes constantly. I change, well, I change the menu weekly, um, sometimes a couple of times a week if I can't get hold of stuff, things like that. But I basically just try and cook food that I want to do, really. It's, when we first opened, I admit now, it was, you know, I sort of did things that basically just regurgitated things I'd done before. Um, but it didn't really work for me. I wasn't really enjoying it. And um, it was a lot of work. I was trying too hard. And then once you got busy and you knew that we were going to be full every day, it was easy to do ordering and stuff like that because you knew you were full. You knew you had to have 50 odd portions for the week and stuff like that. Um, and you ended up sort of just simplifying things a little bit. But it ended up being better because it just flowed better. Um, and I enjoyed that more. So I don't, I don't, I don't really know how to describe the style. I do a six course menu and I just sort of do six courses of what I fancy doing that week, really. Yeah. Um, I guess maybe what ingredients feature prominently, what sort of spices do you like to use? What sort of cooking methods do you use? So yeah, I like to use it like, um, I like, I like um, doing desserts with like um, Middle Eastern, so cardamom, rose uh, with chocolate, coconut and stuff like that. Um, um, I like doing curry, like, fish well basically i've got fish allergy as well so i can't eat fish um so all my all everything that goes with fish i use dashi a lot um or like use veg based vegetable based sources um or sh i can eat shellfish so shellfish based sauces and stuff like that um yeah i don't, I don't know it's, it's weird i don't really i've never really thought about what my style of food or anything like that is i just sort of i just do what it's, I, what it's I, quite hard yeah. to define a style because I don't think very many people fit into a predefined category, but it's, it's always interesting to hear what you're sort of, yeah, yeah, everyone has a propensity towards certain ingredients, certain cultures, and you go through phases. So I guess maybe, maybe you can tell us about a couple of things that you've got on the menu this week. So like I'm using a squab pigeons at the minute, which mm -hmm. is mental. Like my menu price, I shouldn't really be using squabs because they're <laughs> fucking expensive. But, um, so with that, I just do, um, I've got pickled cherries and um, beetroot. I cook the beet. I have a juice, the beetroot, and then I cook beetroot in its juice with just a few spices in that. And then I um, confit leg in a breast. I do a bit of puff buckwheat on it. Um, it's really quite simple. That's gone down really well. And then I'm doing um, like a cured mackerel. Um, I've got a local guy who grows like little shoots, sunflower shoots, which I've only just started using. They're actually quite cool. So it's really simple cured mackerel with um, these sunflower shoots and I make a tomato dashi. So instead of using water, you make tomato water and uh, flavour that with a bit of Viberico pork belly. Um, again, it's really simple. But everything is really simple when it comes to, because I work on my own, I don't have a team of people. Um, and although I'm only doing, well, I'm only doing 10 people, I can fit 14 in the, in the new restaurant, but I can only do 10 at the minute because of the restrictions with COVID and all that. Um, but everything's really simple, but it's because, yeah, I'll say it's only doing 10 people a night. Six courses, 10 people, it's 60 plates of food, isn't it? Yeah. So it's yeah. different really when you scale it up to doing a 60 cover restaurant and there's four or five of you. It's, it works out of that same sort of amount of plates, but I'm doing starters, mains and desserts. So, um, yeah. And is the size of your restaurant what dictates, because you're tasting menu only, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we first, uh, yeah, that was basically when I originally took on the space because it was so small, I thought it suited more towards a tapas bar sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but where we were, um, there's no footfall. And opening a restaurant where there's no footfall when you need to turn people, when you need, you need the covers to make the money, didn't really work on paper. So we sort of worked backwards to work out how much we need to do and then try and think of concepts that will fit into that, work with the space we've got. And the only way it worked on paper was to do a set menu, set price, so we knew exactly, if, even if people only came in and had food, we knew we would get that much. Um, and that's basically the reason we do what we do. But when we first opened, we'd, do, we'd cater for anyone, we'd do any allergy, any dietary requirement, all that sort of stuff. But then it, it ended up just getting ridiculous, like, because I had one fridge, I've got one upright fridge and I've one freezer, tiny amount of space, 
so when you got uh, some nights we'd have 10 people booked in and six of them would have different six different requirements and it just did end up having to have a ridiculous amount of prep to do it and it ended up just not working it didn't work for me i wasn't happy doing it and i think it um had an effect on customers that didn't have requirements yeah were suffering more than people that did um so it got to the point where i I, I couldn't couldn't do it anymore it's like so we ended up saying right we're not going to cater for nut allergies because i use a lot of nut-based sorbets um instead of ice creams and stuff and uh and then it was like, then we've got loads of pescatarians in and obviously I've got a fish allergy, so I have to be careful with that anyway. Um, so I ended up knocking that on the head because I started having loads of reactions to it. Um, and and then gradually it just got to the point where it was, we're just like, we don't have to do it. We've got enough demand now. So if someone can't come in because they've got an allergy, someone else will come in. Um, so it was, it was sort of a financial decision because it was costing us more to cater for people with allergies and, and intolerances so we're having to buy new different stuff, um, and it made life easier. We weren't we weren't losing custom because of it. Because if they can come, someone else would. Um, so it just sort of made sense. I mean, we get a lot of reviews for it. But do you think it, it in a way it affected your creative process as well? Because yeah, having to think in. I was wasn't happy. Well, when when you're sort of doing stuff and you're taking stuff away, it's, it's, it sort of defeats the object of what we do. Really, you sort of create a menu and dishes, and you balance them and how you feel is it's a well balanced dish. And all of a sudden, you've got to take off it out because someone can't eat it. Then you know you're just serving shit, and it's not not out. It's no fault of your own. It's sort of like because I don't I don't have the time or to rethink it. Or, or the space to do it so it was just it was detrimental to what we were doing and uh, i wasn't comfortable doing it anymore um so i'd rather take the abuse and, and the shit you get for di- for not catering for them um then sort of not then doing something that i'm not happy doing yeah right. i think and i feel like it's my it's my choice because you know i've i'm the one that's invested in it. it's my my and it's it's my business I, I can do what i want it's a bit like going to you know going to a vegan fucking restaurant and saying you want a steak it's you know, you know what I, mean? I think I, if i'm reading this correctly the the crucial point here is whether or not you're compromising something so recently yeah. i went to adam handling's restaurant and he has as part of the a tasting menu selection he has a vegan menu so it's yeah. there ready and they've developed it and it worked on the on the dishes so i yeah. called in advance and said that there was a vegan person with me and they were like thank you for giving us a heads up and I obviously like key ate it. I didn't eat it, but just to to see how much detail had gone into the development yeah. of these dishes, that was it. Did not seem like a compromise on their part. They no. they had the time and the thought, and they thought about the cost of it, and it was coherent. Yeah. Um, and it's, and I don't know the thing about that, but like I think some restaurants now are able to diversify in that way, and that's great. Yeah. But if that's not your thing, I think people should leave you to it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'd love to. I'd love to be able to cater for everyone, but it's it's restrictive. You know, can't have it all, can I? So, you know, I work on my own because of space and finances and stuff like that. Um, so I I can't I can't cater for everyone, and that that's just that's just life, isn't it? You can't always have what you want. Um, I'd love to be able to offer menus for everyone and cater for everyone, but it's, it's just it's just not. That's life, you know. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, like, it's like I don't, I don't make my my allergy everyone's problem. If someone says they can't cater for fish allergies, I'm not gonna try. I'm not gonna go beg in to go to their restaurant. I've got a really good friend in Cornwall um, who has a fish restaurant. I'd love to go and support him, but I can't do it. So, yeah, you know. yeah. these are the things in life. Yeah. Right. So uh, I'd like to talk to you now a little bit about um, what's been going on for you for the past six months, because obviously everybody was shut down and that had consequences i think yeah. obviously very negative on the industry from certain aspects but also positive in other aspects you've seen a lot of restaurants and chefs adapting in surprising innovative and really positive ways so yeah. i kind of want to hear what your experience of the lockdown was and how you dealt with it and what you feel that you are coming back with um so, yeah i mean the, the the initial lockdown, I was I was really worried because I'd have I'd taken on a second site, um, and the plan was I've, I have moved. I've moved literally 
original site is one Oscar Road. I've moved to 15 Oscar Road. And the only reason I've done, the only reason I took it on is because it was on the same road. Um, and the original idea was to move to 15 and then turn 15 into a bar, like the Tapas Bar, which was the original idea. Yeah. Um, and use it as like a place for pre-drinks or post-drinks at the other restaurant. Um, and then do a few small dishes and stuff like that. Um, so up for the, for the year up to lockdown because i had it for a long time before while well, i had to sort funding and stuff like that um so i borrowed again for a start of loan company because the banks were still won't touch me um i borrowed 25 grand to refurb this other site um thinking that would be enough it wasn't enough so i ended up investing all the money from the first site any money we got i reinvested everything into, into um expansion um, and we were just we were sort of a month or so away from being finished, and then we got shut down. Um, and obviously, where I've been investing, I, I didn't have I, I had nothing. Um, so I thought that was us done and dusted, really. Um, uh, but luckily, with we obviously got grant, um, we got ten grand grant, which I used to pay off all my supplies. So at least I didn't have that hanging over my head. Um, and that took most of it. And then we ended up having to get a bounce back loan as well, um, 30 grand, um, which is frustrating because with our first premises, I borrowed 15 grand over five years and I've paid that off in January coming up. Um, and I've ended up having to borrow double what I originally borrowed to just to survive, which is annoying, but it's, I'd rather not go under and waste all the time and effort that we put into it so um but other than that i used the lockdown time to finish the refurb really um and luckily we managed to get it all done the first few months were hard because we couldn't get hold of the last few bits of materials we needed to get hold of um but it gave me time to sort of finish it and do it properly and get things done because it was going to be a mad rush to get it done because we were running out of money again um before lockdown it was going to be sort of just just get it done whereas well we had like four months off i managed i took the time and doing things um, and getting it how i wanted it um so it's sort of yeah we were in a lot more debt than we wanted to be but the restaurants turned out exactly how i wanted it to be and yeah. it's gone down really well so um we put the the tapas bells on the back burner at the minute because there's no point in trying to open it. It's too small. We can't get anyone in it. And we're running at 70% capacity in the new site. So it's not great, but it's better than hemorrhaging money every month. Um, I've paid, I've paid, as soon as we got the bounce back loan, I paid all my rent. Um, so I've paid all my suppliers, all my rent, all my bills are up to date. So um, with your um, landlord. What they, what they, um, I've spoke to them both and they're all right for it for the first few months and but I didn't I didn't I knew I was gonna have to pay it so I didn't want to I didn't want to like, just put it off and put it off and let it build up and build up because it gets more and more dawning I don't like owing money to people um so as soon as I got the money I paid them um and yeah I mean, luckily we were nervous about it because we're so small we didn't know how when we opened bookings up how things were going to go um but luckily, we open bookings, and we because we we take bookings sixty days from today, so every day a new day comes available. Um, and we open the bookings, and we filled up within two days, so um, mm -hmm. it's quite good. Um, and yeah, we've been busy, and people have been yeah, all right. I mean, we the service is different to how we want it to be. We having to do like two sittings, so we do a couple of tables at six and then we have to do, we have to turn those tables, clean everything down and we'll do another couple of tables yeah. after that, like eight thirty. Um, it's not ideal. We'd like people to have the table for the night so they can sort of chill out a bit. Um, so whenever things go back to some sort of normal with them, um, we have to sort of rework out how we're going to do service. But, um, yeah. But are people yeah, generally quite understanding of that? I don't know about you, but the only places I've been out, people just are so relieved to be out that it's just... Yeah, I mean, I think, I think most people are all right. I mean, it's, we get a bit frustrated because we, we do say to people, we have to turn the tables and we need you to go before other people come. And we send emails out to people who say, don't come early, literally turn up when your table's booked. And we're still getting people trying to come half an hour early. And we literally don't have the space. 
for mm. anyone playing around. So if, if they turn up half hour early, they're standing outside. Um, and if it's raining, it's raining. Oh, it's not my problem. Um, um, so, yeah, but, but I've, I think I'm quite lucky. When I hear, hear the stories about other places, um, I realise a lot of people got a lot harder than I have. Um, obviously, I think I've got my family support and I use the restaurants. That's my only income. Like We don't... Soph's just got an eight-month-old baby. Soph worked at the restaurant. So she's now not working. So I've employed um, someone part-time to do waitressing. Um, but the restaurants are our only source of income. So um, that's hard. But I also see big restaurants with massive amount of teams and stuff like that that have gone under or struggling and stuff. But what it's meant for us is we just had to sort of tighten up at home. Um, you know, not not go out. Well, we couldn't go out and eat. So it's, you know, it's just yeah just rein it in a little bit um which is hard but but we were obviously we were in the process of trying to buy a house but we've rent we've rented i said we were trying to buy a house as well luckily that has gone through but um it's just been a nightmare really with that sort of thing um yeah it's just been stressful isn't it yeah it sounds like you've braved through it as stoically as you possibly could and I, i take your point about big restaurants you didn't have to furlough anyone you didn't have to make those decisions as to whether or not to let people go I think a lot of the big restaurants suffered from you know that their cash flow was a certain way and they realized that they didn't have grips on a lot of things when it you know when everything started going down yeah and it was it was a an infernal spiral the the fact that you're small means that you know exactly what's happening everywhere in your business and yeah, that's, that's, that's a good thing because I work for myself. I work, I do everything. I do my ordering. I pay my suppliers. I do, I do it all myself, so I know exactly what's coming and going. Yeah. So I've, I've knew, I knew where I was at. I knew, I, I knew if we didn't get, you know, bounce back loans, I knew we weren't going to survive. It's, you know, because I've never had. I don't have backers. I don't have. I've managed to get the money I've got to do the rest of them. I managed to get that myself through startup loans and stuff like that. But if if something drastically goes wrong, I know there's no no one to go begging for money. Um, I can't borrow. I don't have mega rich family. I've, I, you know, I've, everything I've got, I've earned it myself. Um, um, so yeah, I knew if if the government hadn't helped how they have, we wouldn't have been here now. But a lot of people would be in the same position, I think. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, I want to talk to you a little bit about Michelin now. Okay. So you were. I think you were the first recipient of a star at last year's award ceremony, weren't you? Yeah. How yeah. um, you coming up on today? So we were all in the office, um, obviously covering the event while um, my editor yeah. and Mark were at the, the actual award ceremony. And you yeah. Came up on stage, and I think the the host asked you about your restaurant. She said, "Stark, is that is that a reference to something?" And you said, "Yeah." Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> It was because basically, basically the first site we had when we took it on, it was called the Picnic Pantry. So it can't really carry it out on as a restaurant. So we were trying to name it. And at the time, we just started watching Game of Thrones. And yeah, so we got into it and we binge watched it. And so my wife just said, well, what about Stark as, as a name for a restaurant? I was like, I don't know. She goes, yeah. It's quite a cool name. I was like, okay, it was Iron Man's Tony Stark as well. I was like, yeah, fuck it, that'll do. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's loosely based on Game of Thrones and Iron Man. Um, so we use that. So we've got, so in a new restaurant, we've got a few Marvel pictures in the walls. We use, I wear like Game of Thrones t-shirts, Iron Man as uniform and stuff like that. It's just a bit casual, really. Um, but yeah. It rolls off the tongue as well. It has a good sound to it. Yeah. And it sort of means, you know, Stark is like stripped back and stuff like that, yeah. which is what we were going for. And the, the first restaurant's very stripped back, like bare wood, wooden walls, wooden floors, rope lights and stuff like that. So it sort of, yeah, we sort of, it, it just sort of worked and it's, it's worked all right. Um, yeah. And, and we sort of thought, you know, if we end up having a few other places, because the original idea was to take them a small place and then, get somewhere else bigger and then maybe have a bistro maybe have a bakery i've been you know thinking big like fuck that now but um <laughs> yeah um so you can just you can just tag names on the end of it so um yeah it just sort of worked but yeah everyone does ask about why we call it stark <laughs> yeah 
Hey, I think it sticks in people's minds. It's a, it's a good idea. Yeah. As long as you don't yeah. get sued. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, so how did it feel to get a mission start? Were you expecting it that year? Were you sort of buzzing, looking forward to the announcements or is, was it just not on your radar? Um, no, I mean, I, I knew they'd been in um, okay. a couple of times like this, it's previous years because obviously when you first open, they come in there and introduce themselves and, and stuff like that. And But they do that with everyone, I think. Um, and I wasn't expecting it ever really first year. And to be honest, I didn't really think it was achievable where we were because just because of the size of it and the restrictions and stuff like that. And I never really thought about it. Um, but then when it comes around, like every year when they, when it's getting close to the thing, people start talking about it and saying, do you think you'll get one? I was like, no, I don't think so. Um, but, so yeah, I never really thought about it and it was never really a goal. Um, I was just wanted to open a restaurant. My, my aim for when I first opened was just to be the best restaurant in the local area. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that was my aim, really, um, and just to be busy. Um, and I think when you stop thinking about it and stop trying, like, because you know, when you first have, you think, oh, yeah, you'd love to get a star. When you realise just how fucking hard it is to run a restaurant, um, you sort of think the, the main aim is just to be busy, like just to be consistently busy and, and make sure things are right. So I, still, I didn't really think about it. Um, but every time it came round to it, people start saying, oh, yeah, I think we get star and stuff like that. I was like, I don't think we will. Um, but I don't see why we would and other people wouldn't. Um, um, but, yeah, then then we got the email invite a few days before the event, and it was really fucking weird. I think I was on the phone to someone out of the supplier or something, and I got a text from Soph just saying, what does that email mean? Well, I don't know. Don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> got an email from Michelin to go to this event. I was like, mm. I think it means that we might have one. And yeah, it turns out we did. <laughs> um, but yeah, the actual event, I was I was shitting myself. Um, I've never been so nervous in my life. <laughs> um, just because I'm a bit awkward with that sort of stuff. I don't really like. I don't really like the attention. Like I don't really do things like this because I'm. I don't really know how to approach it and stuff like that and I said to Soph I just don't want to be the first person called up on stage because <laughs> as long as other people go before me I'll basically just copy what they say and just sort of twist it to sort of suit me a bit more um, and then I was the first one up so I was fucking I was livid to be fair um, I was just sweating so much I've never sweat so much in my life um, yeah <laughs> but it's good it's, it's I try I don't really think about it very often now um, I try not to because it's quite daunting because because you work on your own when you've got a team of people around you, you sort of all bounce off each other and you, you sort of when you're on your own you just sort of think about the expectations of people going to start restaurants and, and because we're so different to um, other star players people, a lot of people have these perceptions of what a mission star restaurant should be yeah um, I don't know what they should be. I don't know how we get started. I don't know what the criteria is. All I know is I've been awarded one and I'm grateful for that. And it's something I'm quite proud of, but I don't really think about it. And I don't brag about it. I don't advertise it anywhere apart from our website. Um, because I don't want people coming just because we're a starred restaurant. You know what I mean? I want yeah. people to find out about us through word of mouth and, and actually see what we do because then they'll realise that we're not a tape white tablecloths and we don't have a sommelier we don't do wine descriptions we, we're very very stripped back i've based the restaurant based on what i'd want when i go to a restaurant because i don't like all the stuffy shit um so yeah it's it, it's great it's good it's a it's a nice personal achievement but it's also brings a lot of stress and pressure because you know that some people coming in expecting one thing and they get something completely different um, yeah. I, it's not the food thing. It's not, I'm, I'm not. I'm quite confident in what I do food-wise now. Um, but people expect all the other. They think seem to think Michelin restaurants should be this. They should be that. And and if they're not, then they're they're livid. And where how our restaurant is, it's all open plan. I'm literally in the same room as everyone. And as soon as you can tell someone's not happy or they're not enjoying it, it makes it really awkward for everyone. 
Um, yeah, but touch wood, we've, we've been all right. We haven't had that many awkward people. Do you think that it rests on Michelin in the next few years, giving accolades to restaurants that are, you know, sans frills, white tablecloths, and diversifying the restaurants that they're giving them to, for that to sort of pervade into people's mindsets? Yeah, I mean, as far as I know, well, I don't, I, you know, I don't know the criteria and stuff like that, but as far as I know, a Michelin star restaurant is all based on the food. So yeah. you don't take into account the service or where you are or, or what your decor is and stuff like that. Um, and as, I think it's just the general public that seem to think, because it used to be back in the day, it used to be you go to a Michelin star restaurant, it's in a grand building and everything was fancy. And that's what they've come to get used to. Um, and I think if they realise that it's just about the food and it's not about having your water poured for you every two seconds and um, they might actually understand it a bit more. I don't know. It's, um, I think I think a lot of people nowadays saying that Michelin Guide's done and dusted and I find it, I think a lot of people that say that are um, either just a knob because they can't ever get it and they're the bitter um well they don't really understand it because people that slag the michelin guide off will be raving about the fact that they've just got two rosettes or fucking three rosettes or something like that i ain't got any results i don't think the ai has ever been in um they can come in if they want i ain't bothered um but they'll, they'll brag about their good food guide award it's just because they haven't got a star which mm. people seem to think is like the pinnacle then because they haven't got it or they don't know how to do it or they, they've tried really hard to get it then it's a shit irrelevant guide now. It's it's outdated and all that. But to be honest, most guides they're all the fucking saying. They're just they're just recommending restaurants. It's just they've all got the different ways of scoring it. Um and if the Michelin guide's outdated and shit, then so are all of them, because they're all doing the same thing, basically. Um and with social media now, do you really need restaurant guides? Like it's, it's, we we got busy from word of mouth and and a food critic, basically. Um so they came after yeah so, you know do food guys and the star came after i was already i was already fully booked so yeah. um a lot of the time i think the guides it's more of a chef's ego massaging really and, but the thing is michelin guys the amount of inquiries we got we were already fully booked but the amount of inquiries we got and demand just went fucking mental so it is good for business as well so i don't think it's outdated and i think that's i think still think you go to a starred restaurant I still think it's the most reliable guide out there compared to the AA. Um, I think the good food guide probably, I don't know. Yeah. I still think that's probably better than the AA. I find the AA fucking inconsistent to be fair. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not because they haven't been to me. I couldn't give a shit. Um, yeah. I still think if you go to a star restaurant, you can tell the quality is, is, is a lot, more superior than say, I don't know what the AA's average is. Is it three rosettes? Is it four? Um, I don't know. They have the most two, and then you know they're around the same number of twos and threes, and then yeah. a few fours. Because I've I've worked in a lot of I've worked in three rosettes, and I've worked in a lot of twos when I was doing the agency work, and the two rosette restaurants were fucking appalling that yeah. I worked. In. So I don't think it's it's got that good a reputation. Yeah, guide. Uh, I think it, because their criteria is more diverse. I don't know what their criteria is. I've I mean, got I don't a of it somewhere. If you want, I can, I can, um, I can send it to you. It, it's, it, they they pay attention to service. They pay attention to a lot of things that Michelin's like categorically don't pay attention to. Yeah, so see, I, I, I think that sounds more outdated. Mm. I'd say the AA guide sounds a lot more outdated than the Michelin guide because they're taking into account the service and stuff like that. I'm saying this now, they're never going to come in now. Um, <laughs> um, like yeah. Because I think the Michelin guides, how they've got it, are basing it on the food at one star level. I know obviously two stars, they do take into account the service and stuff like that. And three stars, obviously the whole package. Um, but just for the one star, just taking into food to account, I think that's, that's the most basic thing. As long as they're recommending that it's a restaurant, they want you to go there for the food. One star should just be based on the food it's yeah. obviously the only reason i got one because it's not going to be because my decor <laughs> hey it's understated is a is the new 
new fashionable thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what what was the how did it feel to get a star just before the coronavirus lockdown? Do you feel like that was a a bit of a curse or are you happy that you got it last year and that you didn't get it this year because this year it's all going to be a bit weird? Uh it's well a bit of kicking bollocks isn't it really um, <laughs> but they say that when you get a star it's the best year financially you ever have business um i can honestly say this has been the worst for me but um <laughs> but yeah no, yeah it was it was good i mean like i say the demand was there it was a massive massive in, um surge of demand for us but um to be honest i mean i i'm just sort of um proud of got it really and you know if it, if it gets because i know i've moved premises as well i don't know whether i'll keep my stuff um because technically i think they have to reevaluate you and i don't know if they've been in i don't know if they've got a table it booked for when before they announced the guide so i don't know if i lose the star or not um but hey, if, you, if you lose it me, you can't forget it again <laughs> afresh on a normal year yeah yeah, but the thing is, that I'm not that precious about it. Mm. Um, it's something I achieved that I never thought I would achieve. Um, and I've, it's the first, so in my area, like, so I'm in Broadstairs, Ramsgate, and Margate, Thanet, it's the first that's ever been in this area. So, um, so I'm, yeah, but no one can take that away from me, really. So it's, it's done. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, like, be bitter if I lose it because... If it's because I've moved down the road, then fair enough. Um, but that was always part of the plan anyway. Um, it's their due process, um, and it wouldn't be an insult to your food. No. no. And if I don't, even if I don't get a star back, um, I'm not changing anything I do. It's, there's no reason why I should lose it for food or anything like that. But like I said, I've never worked, it's never been a goal for me. It just happened. So I'm not going to cry over it. Um, and I'm not going to, yeah, fall out of anyone over it. I mean, they're being very tight-lipped about what they're going to do yeah. this year. And I don't think anybody really knows. But like you said, I think most chefs at the very least think that it is the most rigorous and up-to-date guide. You know, the one that's still the most relevant. Yeah. Um, so I think they're going to do their best to take account of the circumstances. So I, I hope for your sake that you keep it. But like you said, it's not that's not all that counts. And if you're still fully booked, then... Yeah, yeah. Do you know what? Just carry on doing what you do and see what happens. Yeah. I um I, I want to move on to the next subject. I realised that I'm taking up a lot of your time, and you're in the middle of moving restaurants and house and all sorts. So, <laughs> so let's move on a little bit. Uh, you have recently released a book, a cookbook. Yeah. 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 It's coming out so next week. How did that come about? Um, when when did it come out? What's it all about? So it's actually released next week, I think. I think it's okay. on pre-order already, but I think we get delivery of it next week. Um, but basically, my friend, like so, Bruce Rennie down at Shaw in Penzance, I, um, I met him when I was doing the agency work and he'd done a guest chef at the place I was working. I got on really well with him. He's a similar restaurant to me, so he worked on his own. Um, and he released a book last, I think it was in January, I think it came out. But while he was doing it... Got a copy of it over there. <laughs> yeah good yeah i really like it. i really like bruce he's a solid he's a sound guy um and uh he so i asked him who he's doing it with because i thought it was weird that he was trying to do a book because it's like he hasn't got masses of covers and how is he paying for it um and he told me about a way with media and i sort of thought, do i want to do a book well i know it's hard work so i helped i did graham's book with him at the west house and that was fucking mad um but i sort of thought it's one of these things so they only do a thousand print run and um it's an affordable way of someone like me doing it and i thought i might as well do it just sort of like just to sort of document how we got to where we are um and a lot of people ask us how we did it and why we do it and stuff like that so i thought i might as well just sort of do a story from where we started to where we are now and it basically gives um so i say my side of the story and then we've got Soph's, my wife's point mm -hmm. of view as well so it goes through different stages in my career so yeah there's been ups and downs um we've been through quite a lot 
in our personal lives, me and so. Um, and it shows from my where I've something's happened and I've just gone to work because I have to go to work because otherwise I'm letting anyone down to Sos point of view as well. Um, and this got it's got like a few like fifty odd dishes as well in it. Um, fucking hard work. A lot, a lot of I'm, I'm not good at sitting at a computer. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Um, but yeah, it's basically it's just a story of how we get to where we are. Really, um, there's some pretty dark bits. Um, yeah, but like a, a bit of a cathartic book, sort of yeah. telling people your story. Yeah, basically, and just sort of how we come about um, to get into the restaurant. Because yeah, like I say it's not been an easy ride, but and um, yeah, we just thought we'd document it and. And they, they, yeah, they were happy to work with us, so we thought we might as well do it. And like I say, it's cut, I think it's out next week. Um, Great. And what's, what sort of recipes can people look forward to seeing in it? Is it, so we've got, is it so we've the plan? We've done, so we've done six menus, so six <laughs> menus of six dishes, and so it'll be two meat, two fish, two desserts on each menu. And then I've done 12 tapas style dishes because we were hoping to have the restaurant open obviously that's not happened but um um yeah they're not we haven't dumbed them down to be sort of cook at home we just basically i just because i thought i'm not i'm not the only point me trying to modify everything to say it's cook at home stuff so i just thought i'd do it right down how we do it at the restaurant and then people can pick and take things if they want to um most a lot of people might think it's shite but i'm quite happy with it <laughs> uh, and that's the main thing. I sort of did it so my kids, when they're older, can look through it and sort of see how we got to where we are, yeah. see pictures of them, and hopefully they'll be proud of it. And, you know, I'm happy with it. The publisher's happy with it. Um, hopefully most people will be happy with it. And if you're not, oh. shit happens. Yeah. I think apart from, I can't remember where I read this now, but apart from the sort of Jamie Oliver's, Nigel, et cetera, cookbooks aren't a thing that the consumer buys a lot of. So if you're going to write a cookbook, you might as well not adapt yeah. for the home cook and you might as well target it at an audience that want to know about you, want to know about your food and that know how to, you know, yeah. how to cook your sorts of food, even if it's not to replicate the recipes, just for inspiration and, and understanding of what, what you do, yeah. I guess. Yeah, that's what I think. Um, most of our books, will, they'll be sold through the restaurants. It's not like we're going to be selling loads on Amazon or anything like that. Um, it's purely, if people come in and they like what we do, then they might like to take one home to put on their bookshelf or something. Um, yeah, people. some people like books, don't they? Um, yeah, and if, when it comes to Christmas and stuff like that, people buy vouchers, they buy a book to put a voucher in and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, I'm hoping it does all right, and I do hope people do like it, but yeah, it is quite nerve wracking thinking you know, people just read about you, but yeah. yeah, putting yourself out there in quite a big way. But I guess you yeah. already do that every day, yeah, 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 exactly. Might as well go full hog, eh? Anyway, it's been lovely talking to you, Ben, you. and I wish you all the best. Look forward to seeing your book and um, speak, speak again soon. Take yeah. care of yourself, yeah. take it easy. <laughs> Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this interview and if you have any comments, feel free to tweet us or comment on the post. Uh, we're making all of our interviews available to download. And finally, if you like what we do, whether it's our podcast or our videos or even our features, please head over to our Patreon page and support us there. This episode of Grilled by the Staff Canteen is sponsored by Westlands, the premier specialist British grower of microleaf, growing cresses, edible flowers, inspired leaves, sea herbs and specialty tomatoes. Visit www.westlandsuk.co.uk to find out more.